When I was a child like many of you who would admit to being over 30, it was a different era in neighborhoods. So in my neighborhood, wherever I went, the neighbors knew my name. And whatever I did, they disciplined me as much as my parents. Today, they'd probably be sued for what they did, but what I got, I deserved. They would call me into their home by name to remind me of something I did wrong or to welcome me at their table for something that I was considered part of the family. To be known by name is such a gift. You wear your names tonight. But Lent, this season, reminds us as the first reading reaffirms, we are gifted and called and known as the daughters and sons of God not just another face in this church or in God's eye, but named, called, known, from birth and in the water of rebirth. We begin this season of Lent and our stations now, once on one side, are now all around the church to draw us in, to welcome us, to say, now take the walk, the journey, the way of the cross. And you look on our particular stations by the artist in Cleveland. There are no faces on those, are there? Some think they're not done. The artist would tell us, you look and find your face in every one of them. See your face in every station, whether it's the words of condemnation shouted from Pilate or the words upon a cross that says it is finished or in the wordless woman the Madonna, who just stands and watches one she loves suffer. Your face is in every one of those stations, but so your name. So begin this season of Lent, know that you are called to conversion, a change of heart, a change of attitude, not as another, but as you are, as that daughter and son. So begin this journey, we hope, with all of us, in the season at liturgy, but also in our parish mission that will begin tomorrow evening and go until Tuesday evening. Our presenter this year is Sister Lisa Marie Bells. Lisa Marie has a number of great academic credentials. Many of us have learned under many people with great academic credentials, but not always with lively hearts. She has both a lively heart, and an academic credential. She received her doctorate, as I recall, from Loyola in Chicago, where it was both in scripture and in spirituality, but that was only added to her other degrees, religious studies from Boston and other degrees. She is the head of their department at Ursuline College of Religious Studies. But not only does she come with good knowledge, insight, and education, but she comes as a good person, a good woman of faith, a religious woman of her own community, but also a pastoral woman, for she has served in our missionary team in El Salvador. So she has a unique blend of education and experience, both personal and with people. And so it's my pleasure to present to you Sister Lisa Marie Bell. Sister. I think I have this on. Yeah, now it's working. Okay. What a delight it is to be here with all of you uh, this evening at St. Lad's. I first got to know the St. Lad's community a number of years ago when I came as a missionary from the Cleveland team, uh, sharing some of the experiences there. And uh, and then I got to uh, reconnect with the St. Lad's community about a year and a half ago with a retreat day at River's Edge for the women's group. So it's it's a delight for me to be back here uh, with all of you again and this vibrant parish community. Are there any artists here? If you're an artist, raise your hand. Okay, I don't see too many hands raised, but I bet there are, I, I bet there are people that like to make things with their hands. Anyone here who like, 
you like to tinker with mechanics or or maybe I see a few hands going up okay or, or maybe you like to tinker with with uh, uh, electronics or computers or maybe you like to crochet or knit or is there anybody here who likes to cook Okay, I see a few hands going up there. Okay, is there anyone here who, who's a gourmet cook and you like not just how it tastes, but how it looks? Okay, I see heads shaking up and down. Good. When you make something and it's a thing of beauty, how do you feel? Don't you feel excited? Like, yeah, this is cool. This is really awesome. And, and you want to share that excitement with other people around you? St. Irenaeus says that the glory of God is the human being fully alive. God gets really excited when we are fully alive. And being fully alive is something that God deeply desires for us in this lifetime, here and now. It isn't just something that happens after we die, if we've lived a good life. God wants us to be fully alive in this lifetime, here and now. The glory of God is the human being fully alive. So question, which is more fully alive? A robot or a puppet? Or a human being that can make choices? A human being endowed with reason and given freedom to choose. And by making choices can decide who it will become. By making choices it can become a person of compassion or patience or kindness. It can become a loving person we create ourselves by the choices we make. Now, any parent here can say, what kind of choices do you hope that your child makes? We all hope that our child makes choices that will lead to the child's fullest life. You know, I have a niece, and I've been worrying about her for years. You know, she finds one bad character after another that she dates. And it's like, oh, but I can't live her life for her. You know, she's got to make the choice by herself, right? And so God gives us that freedom. God never imposes goodness on us, but gives us the freedom to choose goodness. And by so choosing, we create ourselves. We create the kind of person that we will be. Now, this first reading today is all about a choice. Did you get what the choice is? It's a, it's a choice between life, or death. Now, they choose to eat something that will lead to death. And we might ask, well, why would they do that? That doesn't seem to be a smart thing to do. But we do it all the time, actually. The biblical writer will have us know that evil is enticing, isn't it? Evil is attractive. And it can fool us. If we knew how ugly and harmful it is, we would never choose it. Just like putting that first cigarette in our mouth. We would never do that if we saw an autopsy of someone who had just died from cancer, from lung cancer. And the biblical writer also wants us to know that evil appears innocuous like it appears to be no big deal. Like, for example, if you're pre-diabetic, like I am, and I'm half Italian, so this is really hard, eating a bowl of pasta, you know, and it's attractive, too, and it would look innocuous, right? And you feel so good after you eat that big bowl of pasta, right? But if you're pre-diabetic, that can become a problem. And the doctor says, no pasta, girlfriend, so, you know, I'm, Evil looks innocuous, and then it appears like it's no big deal. And so it starts off small. And before you know it, it's got us in its grip. 
So in chapter 3 of Genesis, we see Adam and Eve eating the fruit. And by the way, this is not a story that we read for science. It's not a story that we read for history. But it is a story for its profound spiritual meaning. And so in Genesis 3, we see them eating the fruit. And by Genesis 6, just three short chapters later, the whole earth is filled with the consequences as sin multiplies and human violence fills the earth. And this is in direct opposition to the intention of God. As the psalmist says, God's steadfast love fills the earth. But in Genesis 6, it's human violence now that is filling the earth. And so this opening story of Genesis has a number of profound spiritual truths to teach us and warnings about evil. But there is some good news. Now, we've all made mistakes. We've all sinned. We've all chosen wrongly. We've all chosen against our deepest, fuller life in some way or another. And Romans 5 tells us that where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Now, that's verse 20. And strangely enough, the lectionary stops right at verse 19. And I'm not sure why the people who put the lectionary together did that, because Verse 20 summarizes everything that Paul wants to teach us there in those preceding verses. Where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Well, what does that mean? That means that God's power is greater even than our sin. God's power is greater even than the consequences of our sin. That's why we can sing at the Easter vigil, Oh, happy fault! Oh, necessary sin of Adam that won for us such a redeemer. That even though we make mistakes in life, even though we mess up, and even though we have to live with those consequences, if we turn our sin and those consequences over to God's grace, God can transform them, actually, into something beautiful. And that sounds so counterintuitive, doesn't it? But God's power is beyond what we can imagine. God's grace is beyond what what we can intuit. So, for example, you all know the story of the good thief. And the good thief is up there on that cross for making some pretty bad decisions in his life. And anybody seeing that man on the cross would say, his life is an utter failure as he hangs up there in shame and disgrace, dishonoring not only himself, but his family. But grace pursues us at every moment of our life, even to our dying breath. And grace comes to us as the man hanging next to him on the cross. And grace will enter into any little opening we give it. Grace never imposes itself on us and is always awaiting our invitation, even if it's just a tiny little crack to come through and rush through and to bring love and healing and forgiveness. And so this thief, unlike the other thief who stays completely closed, the good thief is the one who opens up and prays, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And grace responds, I assure you this day, you will be with me in paradise. And so grace transforms what appears to be a life that is an utter failure into something profoundly beautiful, a gospel witness to the power of Christ's compassion and pardon and mercy. Now, the truth is, though, we don't really want to be making the choices that are going to get us up on some cross somewhere, even though God's power and God's grace can transform everything, even our sin, because what God really wants for us is to live a full human life where we discover our deepest joy. And that's what the psalmist says today. Give me again the joy of your salvation. What is salvation? That's a churchy word we hear all the time in church. In the ancient world, that word was used quite a bit, and all it really means is well-being. Give me again the joy of your well-being, the joy of being fully alive in your presence. Again, not for when I die, but now. Give that joy to me. That's what God deeply desires for us, 
to live in that joy of being fully alive now. But that joy only comes to us through those choices for life. And so what helps us then have the moral strength to make the choice for life? Given the fact that evil can be so deceptive and so attractive and appear even innocuous, and that's what the gospel then has to teach us today. Where do we find Jesus? Where does Jesus start off in the gospel today? The spirit drives him where? Did you catch that? Right to the desert. The spirit can bring us to some places that we might be surprised by. And the desert represents the place of encounter with God. The Israelites spent 40 years in the desert. It was a place where, where they encountered God in powerful and transformative ways. The desert is also the place where we encounter our demons as well. But God's presence never forsakes us. The desert represents the solitude, the silence, of being alone with the God who dearly loves us. Lent invites us to create regular times and spaces of that desert silence where we leave distractions behind us, whatever they may be. We leave the electronics behind us, we shut off our phones, we shut off our computers, and we spend time with the God who loves us dearly. That helps us. Uh, it helps us to choose wisely. It helps us to choose what will lead to our deepest joy and, and greatest well-being in this life. But notice what also Jesus does. He fasts. And Lent is a time for us to consider what do we need to fast from in order to live a fuller, deeper life. Maybe we need to fast from negative self-talk. Maybe we need to fast from criticism or, bit or bitterness or blame. Maybe we need to fast from a TV program or a, or a the computer or the internet in order to spend a little more time and give a little more loving attention to a neighbor or a relative who needs it. So Lent is a time to consider what do we need to fast from in order to encounter our deepest, fullest life. And then we look at how Jesus confronts temptation. Did you notice every single time he responds with a word of scripture. Not by bread alone does a human being live, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. And what we see with Jesus' response is that he has so taken in the word of God, it's a part of him, he can quote it. And so we too are invited to make the word of God our nourishment our sustenance. Let us not be like children at a fancy banquet who are happy to eat only potato chips when God wants to give us the good stuff. And so make the word of God your food this Lent. And think of good habits. Good habits to start during this Lent. Good habits of reading scripture. Uh, good habits of participating in the sacraments. The sacraments give us a great deal of power in order to have that moral strength to make the right choices, those choices that will lead to greater life for us and greater well-being. And so as you enter into Lent, consider what, where do you find your fullest life and where do you find your deepest joy? Lent is not about beating ourselves on the breast. It's, it's not about doom and gloom. It's about looking at our life again and reflecting. What change do we need to make so that we can live a fuller, deeper, and more joyful life? Because that where the glory of God is to be found in us living fully here and now. Amen.